to say thanks to Sarah for giving me a chance to talk about our research and for all of you uh, who are here. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Ben Connor. I am a, a volunteer with Daring Adventures, so I hope in the future, if I haven't met some of you, to meet you on some future trips that will eventually happen. Um, but uh, thank you for tuning into this. So today, I was going to talk to you guys about uh, what my lab does. Uh, and in general, my lab uses is, uh, assistive technologies to uh, train mobility in individuals with movement disorders. And it's a really broad, general term with a lot of jargon. Uh, but essentially, we try to help people move better by using technology. And my project specifically uh, was looking at the use of a robotic exoskeleton that we developed in the lab for children and young adults with cerebral palsy. And so I'm gonna uh, talk to you guys about that project today. Uh, and as a, a brief outline, oops. Um, I'll start off, I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself and our lab. I'll explain what exotherapy is, our exoskeleton. And I also wanted to give a brief background on what cerebral palsy is and, and how it affects mobility, uh, just for those people who are here today who might not know about CP. And then uh, fortunately, we have uh, a testimonial, or we'll get a testimonial today from one of our former participants, Joe Day, uh, and his mom, Dee Dee, who are here. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. So a, a little bit about me, um, and, and Sarah, I just want to make sure, can everyone see my screen right now? Yes, yeah. I can. Okay. Yeah. okay, awesome, awesome. So just a little bit about me, I grew up in a town called Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, and everyone finds this name really funny, uh, but oddly enough, it's called that because Way back when, before uh, there were cars, wagons on the East Coast would stop in Mechanicsburg because all of the mechanics lived there to repair their wagon. Um, and on New Year's, New Year's Eve, when everybody, if you see in New York City, they drop a ball for New Year's Eve, we actually drop a giant wrench. And I'm not even kidding, <laughs> we, we, we drop a, a giant wrench. So um, that's my hometown. My backyard was a bunch of uh, uh, cornfields, and it's it's really um, a, a farm town. Uh, and I didn't go far for my undergraduate. I went to Penn State University, which is about two and a half hours away from where Sarah did her degree at Slippery Rock in Pennsylvania. So um, we're both, yeah, we we're both in PA for that. Uh, and um, Love Penn State, love Penn State football. I think you'll see uh, in the top corner, uh, one of the pictures is uh, my, my family and I at a Penn State football game. That's a for us. I've been going to Penn State football games since I was you know, able to walk. And uh, I was actually the 30th person in my family to go to Penn State. So it's a, a big deal in our family. Uh, from there, I did a master's degree in biomechanics uh, at the University of Delaware. And to be honest, before I went to the University of Delaware, I didn't even know Delaware was a state. And, it, and it's small enough that it might not be a state. Uh, but I had a really good experience there. I studied uh, different interventions for people with movement disorders. That's where I was first exposed to cerebral palsy. Um, and that was about... Uh, five years ago uh, that, that I started that. Um, when I was at UD, I was doing a, a research focused degree, which meant a lot of what I did was in the lab. I had some interactions with uh, patient populations, but not many. And, um, and what I realized is that I really missed that. Uh, you know, I wanted to interact with people. I wanted to be able to treat them and heal them. And so I decided that I wanted to go to medical school, but I wanted to keep doing the research that I was doing uh, on these uh, people with movement disorders. So uh, I was fortunate to get accepted to this dual degree program at the University of Arizona. 
uh, and that's what brought me out to Phoenix. I think the closest family member I have to me lives in uh, Maryland is, is the closest. So I, I went way out here. I didn't know anyone when I moved here. Uh, I just drove out here with uh, my two cats in the back of my car. And um, that was a, a little over three years ago, but it's been great. Um, so a little bit of my hobbies. I, I love my pets. I have my two cats. Uh, there's a picture of them there. The white um, uh, kind of brown one is Danny. She's a girl. And then the black and white tuxedo is Renly. Uh, and then uh, so these are my girlfriend's and I's pets. And then uh, we have a dog named Riley. So um, that's my girlfriend, Natalie, in the top left corner, I think. I don't know how your screen's oriented, but you yeah. can see Riley. But OK. And you can see Riley between us. Um, she was a, a rescue. Uh, and my girlfriend, Natalie, is actually a veterinary student at the University of Florida, which I know Dee Dee loves. Um, <laughs> Go Gators. Go Gators. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, you know, as much as quarantine is difficult these days, it's been nice, a little nice for me because uh, Natalie's been in Phoenix with me during it. Um, and she rescued Riley. Uh, uh, Riley was actually in a scientific study at the vet school, and uh, Natalie ad adopted her afterwards. So um, we always say there's something a little wrong with her because um, she's she's pretty weird as a dog, but uh, we love her. And um, I, I really like the outdoors. I love riding bikes. Uh, the top middle picture is my friend Sam and I, we biked from uh, Chicago, Illinois to Hershey, Pennsylvania uh, the other fall. Um, and we just camped along the way and it was a lot of fun. Uh, so I really enjoy that. And uh, drinking coffee. I love drinking <laughs> coffee. Who doesn't? So um, a fun fact that I, you know, whenever I do orientations for school and stuff, we always have to say a fun fact. And I can't tell if I make friends by telling people this fun fact or I lose friends. I'm not really <laughs> sure. But a fun fact I have is that I once toilet trained my cat. So that was Danny, the brown and white one. And she used our toilet, uh, which was great. You know, it was really easy to clean. And um, unfortunately, I then, uh, we then adopted Renly, the black and white one, and he could not figure it out. He kept falling in the toilet. He would go in the bathtub. Yeah. Uh, it just was a mystery to him so we had to scrap that plan and we went to a litter box but uh, for a little while there if you, if, you, if you came to my house um, you might see a cat on the toilet bowl but <laughs> I just told Joe <laughs> he's like no it can't I go he says it can <laughs> I'll, I'll have to find a video at some point to show Joe Joe to, to convince him. So that's that's a little bit about me. Uh, but I did want to tell you guys about my lab because I'm going to pre present this study and, and some of our findings today. And I think for people who come into the lab and only see my face, they sometimes think that I'm responsible for everything, but it really takes a village. And I'm really fortunate to be able to work with people one on one and use the uh, exoskeletons that we develop, but there are so many people behind the scenes that work on it. And uh, I think most importantly, well, not most importantly, but uh, part of that is our boss. And that's uh, the guy at the top, top here. Uh, this is Dr. Zach Lerner. He is our principal investigator, which essentially means he, he leads the lab. And uh, Zach is the one who came up with, Dr. Lerner is the one who came up with all of the these ideas. He designed the exoskeleton. He recruited all of us to be able to help test it. Um, so he's, he's a great guy and I owe a lot of uh, the opportunities I have to him. We have uh, on the right here these four individuals. This is Greg. Can you see my pointer? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. So uh, this is Greg right here. Sarah. This mm. is Leah. And this is uh, uh, Jason. And all four of 
these uh, guys right here, they do a lot of the hardware development. So all of the components of the exoskeleton that we had were designed and fabricated by them in the lab. Uh, on the other end, this is uh, Jason again and Chance, and they work on the software part of it. So um, how is the exoskeleton controlled? Uh, this is uh, Dr. Fang, she's a postdoc, and uh, um, this is Taryn, and they do the biomechanics testing, which means uh, a lot of how does the exoskeleton do when someone walks with it. Then we have our uh, systems engineer here. This is Tong, he's another postdoc, and um, what the systems engineer does is they are the ones who integrate all of this stuff into one system so, so that it works together really well. And then finally, um, you have uh, this handsome guy at the bottom who does all the clinical testing. Um, just kidding. But uh, so uh, I'm the one who gets to take all of this stuff that they work really hard on in the lab and, and test it out in, in the clinic uh, like I've done. Um, with Joe. So on to exotherapy and our, our exoskeleton technology. First though, I want to give a brief background on cerebral palsy. There may be, I know there's at least one of you on this call that has CP, so uh, this is, you know, uh, pretty easy for you to, to remember, but um, just for those who don't know what CP is, I wanted to give a brief overview. So uh, CP is caused by injury to the brain before brain development is complete. And because of that, it's different than a stroke. Uh, a stroke is, you know, um, after the brain has developed, uh, it's typically in young adults, older adults, um, and that injury, you know, uh, causes a stroke. With CP, it's before the brain has finished development. Uh, and so it's, it's a little different, uh, it has a different uh, symptomology than a stroke, uh, although it can be similar. The thing about CP is that it is um, a really, it's, it's an umbrella term. You could see two individuals who both have CP and you would have no idea that they have the same diagnosis. Uh, but in general, it's a movement disorder. Whoa. It's actually the most common physical disability in childhood. Uh, it affects about 17 million people in the world right now. Um, and uh, we say it's about, uh, the occurrence of it is about two to three in every 1,000 births. Um, because injury is occurring before brain development is complete, it's thought of as a pediatric neuromuscular disorder. And we can break down that word to make that a little more simple. Uh, neuromuscular, neuro, it, you can just think of it as that's the brain, and muscular, those are your muscles. And so it's a disorder with how the brain communicates with the muscles. When um, you walk around or you're uh, moving, the way I'm moving my hands right now, uh, even if I'm not consciously thinking about it, my brain is telling my muscles what to do. Uh, and because uh, during development, there's an injury to the brain, uh, that connection is somewhat altered. And, and that's what causes the, the movement disorder and the symptoms of CP. The goal of treatment and therapy for individuals with CP is to maintain or improve functional mobility. So what does functional mobility mean? <laughs> functional mobility represents movements that you do throughout the day. You walk around, you get up from a chair, you grab dishes out of a cabinet, things like that. And so the goal of therapy is to help you improve those movements so that you can lead an independent lifestyle. Um, on the right, uh, I always like to include this picture. This is Justin uh, Galagos, I think his last name is. And he is a professional runner with CP. Uh, and he was actually uh, signed by Nike. He was Nike's first professional <laughs> athlete with CP. Um, so uh, he's a really impressive runner. The reason that our research has come about and the reason that we do the research uh, that we do is 
we feel that the current strategies to address mobility and functional mobility and what I just uh, talked about for individuals with CP is somewhat lacking. So the typical treatment strategy, if you have CP or your son or daughter has CP, uh, typically, and it can, it can vary a ton, but typically it's a combination of surgery, physical therapy or occupational therapy and assistive devices. So surgery, um, this can be this can mean a lot of things. So uh, people will get orthopedic surgery, and that's to change how your bones are aligned, um, or they'll change how muscles attach to the bones. Uh, you can also have neurosurgery, where uh, alterations are made to the spinal cord or the brain that help with uh, some of the um, disorders of movement that arise from CP. Physical therapy and occupational therapy are keys to rehab for individuals with CP. Uh, it can help them learn a lot of activities of daily living. Uh, it can help you to um, uh, get better at certain tasks. Uh, and you can see right here uh, is a, a physical therapist going through a movement with for a kid. And what that is is by pushing the person's limbs through different movements, the brain can actually learn that movement. Um, and so that's a, that's a really common strategy in, in physical therapy for people with CP. Um, a lot of uh, individuals with CP will have braces. What you'll see, what you see at the bottom there is something called an ankle foot orthosis uh, or an AFO. And that can help with things like toe drag, uh, to prevent uh, trips and falls. It can make some people walk a little faster, so that's also pretty common. And then a new uh, therapy is something called partial, partial body weight support treadmill training, or PBWSTT. And this is a really cool uh, robotic device mm -hmm. that helps to train uh, how the legs should move while walking. The caveat of this is that this device costs over $300,000, and uh, it's really rare to find one if you're not in a major city, so uh, it definitely has some limitations. Um, but what we found is that none of these specific uh, strategies directly address something called functional ankle performance. So why do we care about the ankle? Well, the ankle... Uh, is is the major is where the majority of walking takes place. Next time you walk, you can you can try and think about this, but uh, the majority of uh, your push off power when you take a step um, and while you're walking comes from your ankle. Uh, it's not your knees or your hips. And the issue with uh, or the limitation of all of these other interventions is that they don't directly address how the ankle should work while walking. And so that's the gap that we wanted to fill because we felt like if we could do that, we could improve mobility um, and really improve how someone moves through their day. And so that's how we came up with our exotherapy. The full name of exotherapy is exoskeleton ankle resistance therapy. And our exoskeleton here is on the left. It has a ton of components, uh, which I won't take the time to try to explain uh, because some of it I don't even understand <laughs> because <laughs> I'm not I'm not the engineer um, but uh, the engineers have done a great job in designing this but what it looks like is uh, sort of like a fanny pack that's worn around the waist and at the waist is where a lot of the weight of the exoskeleton is carried so if you follow this red line down you can see what all you're wearing at the waist here uh, the, this black and silver right here, these are two motors. Um, and what those motors do is they pull on cables that go all the way down to the ankle. And you can kind of see these black lines here that go down to the ankle. There are cables in, those, in that housing. And those go down to something we call the ankle assembly. And the ankle assembly consists of a pulley and a foot plate. 
And what happens is that as someone is walking with the exoskeleton, we're able to resist using this ankle assembly right here, the movements at the ankle. And you might say, okay, why are you resisting movements at the ankle? That makes no sense. We want to make it easier for someone to walk. Well, we have a feature that does allow you to assist with the movement to make it easier to walk. But in terms of therapy, we actually want to make it harder so that once you take the exoskeleton off, it seems a lot easier. You can think of it as wearing ankle weights while you walk around or going to the gym and lifting weights. It's a, it's a similar concept. There's a lot of uh, technology and controls in here that make it so that this uh, exoskeleton adapts specifically to how someone is walking. Um, and, and I can kind of show you how that works in this next slide here. So um, not to overcomplicate things, but um, the whole goal of this exoskeleton therapy, at least what we did last summer, was to increase how hard you push off when you walk. So when, uh, if you think of my arm right here as uh, walking and my foot hits the ground, my foot being my hand here, and you push off into the next step, what we wanted to do with our exotherapy is to really increase how hard someone pushed. Because by doing so, we can allow people to walk faster, we can increase their endurance, um, and lower the amount of energy it takes them to walk. Uh, so we did uh, what we called a, like a preliminary trial to see how well the exoskeleton increases push-off. And so what you can see here is this dark blue line is with no exoskeleton, and this light green line, or I don't know, turquoise, whatever you would call it, is with our exoskeleton on. And uh, basically what this showing is that it increased uh, uh, push off by 25%, which was huge. It was great. Um, so it was, it was more of a, uh, um, it, it was a good concept uh, validation. Mm -hmm. The other thing we try to do with our exoskeleton is to induce motor learning. Motor learning is a way to learn a new skill. Say you wanted to learn how to uh, get better at shooting a basketball. You wanted to get better at free throws. There are certain things you would want to do in order to get better at shooting those free throws. Uh, one is you would want it to be task specific. So if uh, you wanted to get better at shooting basketball, uh, you wouldn't go play golf, right? It's just not the same thing. It's not a good way to practice that skill. So you want it to be task specific. Because our uh, participants can wear the exoskeleton while walking, it's task specific. They're doing it while walking. Uh, there needs to be active engagement. If I'm shooting the free throws for you, you're never going to get better at them. You have to be actively involved. Again, because these participants in our study were walking and using the exoskeleton and really having to push against resistance, they were actively engaged. You need a lot of repetitions. If you only shot a free throw three times, you probably wouldn't get that much better. You would need to do it several times over several days uh, and that's what we did for our study and then finally it needs to be challenging you need a way to be able to adjust how hard it is as you get better uh, so um, for for our study specifically as our participants got better we increased how much we resisted walking so that they had to work harder and harder as the study went on so that's kind of the, the overview of the study. Um, uh, to break it down and to summarize, uh, you, uh, we had our uh, participants wear our exoskeleton. As they were walking and pushing into each step, our exoskeleton resisted them doing that. So they had to work really hard to take a step. We had them in for 10 sessions, 10 training sessions. And each training session included 20 minutes of walking. And so I'm going to show you guys a, a few graphs on the results we got. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a video, um, not Joe's video yet. That'll be coming up, but a <laughs> video of, uh, of someone going through the training, just so you can get a, a visual of what this looks like. Oh, and I, I should also mention this. Ooh, that is cool. Um, 
this is what we measure before and after training. So we have a lot of equipment in the lab that I'm in right now. Uh, one of them is something called 3D motion capture. So uh, if you guys have ever played video games like, uh, or, or seen movies like the Polar Express or Avatar, something like that, they use 3D motion capture to make those movies and, and those games. And what they do is they put reflective markers on people and then they track how those markers move and then using those markers, they recreate that person as an animation. And we do that with all of our participants. So what you can see here is one of our participants. Uh, uh, it, it's hard to see, but these are the markers I'm talking about. You can kind of see one on his right shoulder here. You can see them on the side of his leg. And we're able to use that and create a 3D figure of him. And so this is actually him walking uh, and we've recreated it as a 3D model. And from that, we're able to measure, uh, so those red lines represent muscles. We're able to measure how his muscles are working, what his joint angles look like, things like that. Amazing. In addition to that, we use uh, sensors to measure muscle activity. Uh, and so that's what, uh, this is right here, soleus EMG and tibialis anterior EMG. All that's saying really is that we measure the electrical activity in the muscle so we can see what, what are the muscles doing while someone is walking. And that's really important uh, in a neuromuscular disorder like CP because uh, that electrical activity represents what the brain is telling those muscles to do. So we wanna measure that. We wanna know what is the brain telling the muscles to do while they walk and how does that change with training? That's kind of our before and after. So uh, here's some of our results. Uh, don't get overwhelmed by the numbers. Uh, I just didn't have time to take these out. Uh, what I want you to pay attention to are the bars. So this first graph right here represents how strong uh, the ankle was before and after training. So the red is before training and the blue is after training. And this, this is an average change for six people. Uh, and Joe was one of them actually. Uh, so the gray lines as well represent what a kid around the same ages as these participants would be at. Just so you can get an idea of um, someone without CP kind of where we're trying to get to. So uh, the kids got stronger after uh, the intervention, not necessarily to uh, the same level as someone without CP, but on their way. And so we can continue to improve on that. Um, this measure right here, uh, the second graph, represents how hard the muscles were uh, fighting one another. So something that's pretty common in CP is called spasticity. What spasticity means essentially is that you have two muscles that are opposite one another on the body and they fight each other. And that's bad because if you want to move a joint, say I want to move my arm up, if I have the muscle opposite fighting me at the same time, I have to use a lot of energy to overcome that. And so it, it's not a good thing uh, and we want to reduce it to a certain level. And we measure that before and after training. And what you can see is that after training, we, got a, we had a big reduction in this spasticity level. And then finally, we wanted to look at uh, how, how uh, the activation profile, um, essentially how well someone's uh, muscles worked while walking. Is it, are the muscles firing at the correct time? Uh, and so uh, if it was at one, meaning it, it worked 100% of the time, um, it would be, you know, it would be perfect. Uh, but what we saw was that uh, it, it increased significantly, not to one, but uh, it, got, it got a lot higher than it was before. So, so that was a great finding. Hey, Ben, real quick. Yeah. So th this study was, what, 20 weeks? Uh, 20, it was 10 20 days. Session? In, in 10, 20 sessions, though, or? It's only 10 sessions. 10 sessions. So does, would the study, if you did it for 20 sessions, would those numbers be doubled or they continued I, to? 
That's a great, that's a great question. Way. Yeah, that's a great question, Jerry. We believe, I don't know if it would be doubled, but we, we do believe that if the study, if we could train these kids for longer, that we would continue to have improvements. So it would be even greater improvements than what I'm presenting right. now. Um, the unfortunate side of science and studies like that is that they cost money. Uh, so we're somewhat limited on how long we can have someone with us, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I'll talk about this a little towards the end. Um, we hope to eventually have these exoskeletons accessible to uh, for people to take home, uh, at which point, you know, they could do it for 20 sessions. Right. They could do it all year. Right. Uh, and, and that would be excellent. Um, yeah, because Joe improved. So I can't, Joe improved a lot, and even when we got the treadmill, hit the muscles went back down. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's 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 something. Um, so we're we're in like relatively early stages of testing this. Uh, so like for example, we know Joe did well with it. Yeah. Uh, but we've only tested. Uh, it's been eight people at this point. So there's a possibility for some people it, it wouldn't help, um, gotcha. or for others it would help even more. Uh, yeah. We just don't know yet, unfortunately. But we're we're on our way to figuring that out. Uh, right. So, but yeah, cool. that's a good question, Jerry. Um, what this graph is showing right here is uh, is basically the same thing, but in two different ways. So again, red is before training, blue is after training. This represents, this graph right here, uh, how efficient someone is when they move. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going back or, or changing topics here, but, uh, and this is gonna sound like a tangent, but I promise it's not. Uh, part of the reason that uh, we as a species are so successful in, as, uh, in what we do and the reason you know, we became so successful, the human species, is because we are really efficient walkers and runners. So we can go super long distances walking and running, whereas another species will, will overheat, it'll take them too much energy to do that. Um, so like, for example, uh, uh, an antelope or something like that uh, is a much faster sprinter than us. Uh, and if you think, way back when to when we needed to hunt them to survive, they're much faster than us. There was no way we we're gonna catch them. But we can walk and run for very long periods of time. So, you know, that antelope can keep sprinting and sprinting and sprinting, uh, but eventually it's gonna tire out, whereas we can go consistently. Sounds like a huge tangent, <laughs> but the reason I bring that up is because uh, as a species, we're really efficient in how we walk. So um, that's something we want to change for uh, individuals with CP because they're a little less efficient than uh, someone without CP. And what that means is it takes a lot of energy for them to move, uh, which can, uh, can affect things like, you know, how much they want to play, how long they want to play, the distances they can walk. And so that's something we're trying to improve. Uh, and what we found with our study was that um, this efficiency went up a ton. Uh, and that was a, a big finding. We didn't expect to see such an improvement, but, but we did. Uh, and in the second graph, uh, this is before, uh, red again is before, and blue and purple are after, uh, but these are at two different speeds. This is how much energy it took them to walk at a certain speed. And what you can see is that this went, this went down a lot. It was reduced mm -hmm. by uh, around 30% at both speeds, which means, and, and it actually got really close to uh, those without CP. And what this means is that um, uh, because these kids required less energy to walk, they could walk for longer distances. Um, so it was a great finding. And then finally, th these last two graphs, um, we looked at uh, uh, two tests that uh, if any of you have been to physical therapy, you might recognize these tests. The one on the left here is called the timed up and go. And what that is, is you sit in a chair, there's a cone three meters away from you, and you're timed on how quickly you can get up from the chair, walk around that cone and sit back down. 
so what this is showing here before and after is that the amount of time the amount of time it took people to do that went down uh, so that was a great finding they were faster in how they did that and then this uh, second graph right here is something called the six minute walk test uh, so I'm sure if you've done this in therapy, you would remember it because it's a, a really hard test. And what it is, is you have to walk for six minutes as fast as you can. And, and the outcome measure is how far can you walk in six minutes? And so compared to before, or after these individuals were able to walk further. Uh, so again, a, a great finding. So, uh, you know, I just want to follow up with this. Uh, graph right here to show how, or this figure right here to show how we think exotherapy can fit into a typical treatment strategy. Uh, we think it has a nice uh, niche right here to go to complement things like surgery and physical therapy and braces. It wouldn't replace them, it would, it would complement them. So I'm going to show you guys a video actually of someone going through our training. Uh, which I think, you know, says a lot, um, is a lot easier to understand than all of these, all this talking I'm doing. So this is one of our participants going through. This is him, and I'm going to pause this real quick. Uh, this is him before uh, he starts the training. And I'm sure Joe will remember this blue mask. Uh, nobody likes it. I don't <laughs> like wearing it. Uh, but what we do with that is we collect how much uh, oxygen someone's using and, and that's how we measure how much energy it takes um, it's not super comfortable to wear and we try to make it as painless as possible uh, and then you'll see that this kid also has markers on on him he's got a lot of tape on him and that's to hold our muscle sensors on uh, but this is his initial visit and whenever someone is walking on the treadmill in these videos uh, just keep in mind that they choose the speed. So this is the speed that they feel comfortable at. Oops. Okay, so uh, this is a 12-year-old uh, with CP. Um, and this is him on his first visit right now. This is him starting the training. So he's wearing the exoskeleton. And what you'll see is that he's really pushing some ground on each step. And the reason he's doing that is because whenever he pushes, the exoskeleton resists him. So he has to push even harder then to take a step. And that's, that's the point of the, of the therapy. Uh, as his training goes on, we are increasing that resistance level. So how much uh, the exoskeleton resists each step. You also notice that the speed goes up. Uh, and that's because he's, he's becoming more comfortable on the treadmill. Uh, his steps are getting better, so we were able to increase speed. Hi. And and I don't have a video of every training session, uh, but uh, so this is his actually his last training session. This is him on his last visit, his visit 12. Um, and you'll see a side by side of his before and after. And again, this is only 10 training sessions before and after uh, visit one versus visit 12. Wow. Yeah. That is so the, cool. It's a pretty, yeah, some pretty profound results. Um, oh, yeah. So I, I want to talk uh, a little bit about, about, you know, where our lab is headed and what our, what our goal is in the future. And um, ultimately, we want to create a, a tool uh, and several tools that someone can take home with them and use to uh, get targeted physical therapy without having to go into the clinic and pay however much um, for extra physical therapy. So we don't, again, we don't, don't want to replace physical therapy. We want to supplement it so that people can get more and more uh, treatment at home. And so what are, what are we doing to, um, to do that? So uh, one is that our, our lab and specifically Dr. Lerner has just started his own company to commercialize our device. And uh, it's in the very early stages, but our hope is to eventually put the device on the market so that someone could buy an exoskeleton, take it home, and then on their phone would be an application where they could control the exoskeleton and, and train at home. And either they could do it by themselves or with a parent or guardian. Mm -hmm. 
We are working on uh, a knee and ankle exoskeleton. So in addition to training the ankle, it would also train the knee. And this could be really beneficial uh, for individuals who could also benefit from uh, some retraining of how the knee works while walking. Uh, like I said before, the, the ankle is much more important while someone walks, uh, but for some individuals, uh, their knee is actually more affected than their ankle. And so we wanna be able to address that as well. So we're working on a knee and ankle exoskeleton uh, right now in, in developing one of those. And then finally, we want to expand to different populations. So, um, you know, my expertise and what I've been studying for the past five years has been individuals with CP and specifically children and young adults with CP. Uh, but we think that this exoskeleton and this training could be beneficial for a wide variety of populations. Uh, people who have had a stroke, uh, people with other movement disorders, and maybe just people who have injuries from playing sports or something like that. So we wanna expand um, who we can reach with this design. That's kind of our, the future of the lab. So on to our, our testimonial, the, the best part of the day. <laughs> um, so we're fortunate today to have uh, Joe Day with us. Uh, and I do, I do want to give a quick caveat that um, uh, any participation in our studies is confidential. Uh, the reason that we're talking about Joe today is because his mom gave permission for that. So uh, just so you know, um, unless you give permission, we wouldn't mention that you were in, in one of our studies. Um, I just want to give that quick note. Um, but something that was uh, really cool with Joe is that he was the first one to test out our biofeedback feature. And uh, what biofeedback is, is it's a way to see in real time uh, how well you're performing with the exoskeleton. And so for Joe, what we did is we uh, took his muscle activity that we were measuring with our sensors on his legs and we graphed it as a bar graph on a screen for him and his goal with each step when he pushed was to make the bar turn red and he could make it turn red by pushing harder and so um, you'll see and this is actually a video right here of him with uh, one of our uh, uh, one of the nurses on our team uh, Emily uh, who uh, I, I know misses Joe a lot I was supposed to pass that on um, uh, working with him on this biofeedback feature. So I'll play this video. So you can see that, uh, and this is specifically with Joe's right foot. So you'll see that as Joe pushes off, off with his right foot, when he does steps, it turns red. Uh, and so his goal was to look at the screen and you can see he's getting psyched about this because he's making it turn red, uh, was with a push, make the bar turn red. I can say I've, I've tested this out myself and it's not easy to do. So uh, Joe is having to take really good steps to make it turn red. So that was a good one. That was a good one. Uh, and again, it's, it's just focusing on his right leg right now. So this is Joe <laughs> going through it. Good job, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, good job. Look, yeah. oh, they, they cannot see you. So um, I did want to show a quick uh, before after video of Joe as well. Um, and again, this is a before and after 10 training sessions that were each 20 minutes long. And what I want you to specifically focus on is Joe's right leg. Um, you'll see, uh, think about uh, how big his steps are on the right side. So what you'll see in the pre-training is that Joe is taking pretty small steps. He's not really pushing off into the step. He'll occasionally have a, a, a good one, but a lot of them are pretty uh, small steps. What you can see with the post-training is that, one, Joe is walking at a much faster speed and his steps are huge. Each step is big, he's pushing off, he's getting his heel to hit first. They're really high quality steps. And Joe is doing it while wearing a mask, which which is not fun at all to do. Um, in, in the pre-training, uh, we, we couldn't get Joe 
or, or it was it was too uncomfortable for Joe uh, to walk at this speed with the mask on. And in the post training, he's walking at an even faster speed while wearing a mask. The reason I mention the mask is because when you're wearing the mask, you can't see your feet. So it takes a lot of control and uh, muscle memory to be able to walk while wearing it because you can't see your feet. Uh, if you think about just walking around, a lot of the times you look at your feet to see where you're stepping. And, and Joe's not able to do that in this video on the right. So uh, you can see that the vast improvement that Joe made uh, before and after his training. And you and, can and literally this see how much bigger his legs are, can't you? Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, Didi, did you yeah. see a lot of reduction in spasticity? And is that reduction of spasticity maybe um, a contributor to like the possibility of those bigger steps and having more range of motion? the bigger step and the heel strike because people would be they would come up to me like he is walking so much better unfortunately <laughs> it, it regressed even though we got our own treadmill and i have it on an incline without that resistance he stopped putting that heel down did that go pretty quickly did he um no month two three four months and then yeah. back to where he was before his legs wow. are still yeah but we work on other stuff, but nothing was as, I think, effective as this was. That, Joe, in itself is really interesting data there. Yeah. That without it, how it complements, you know, what he had. And then three mm. months not having it, you know, where he's at now. Yeah, those that muscles are just so hard to, to build. I don't know why CP does that. I really don't. Yeah, but he's it's, back to some pretty skinny legs, even though we do bike riding and swimming. It, it's it's definitely a, a challenge. And, you know, I'm sorry to hear that Joe has uh, somewhat regressed. I, I hope that we can, you know, get him back into the lab to do some more of this stuff. Um, yeah. The, um, the, the nice thing about the exoskeleton is that we're able to modify uh, uh, what exactly about the ankle is being trained. So like, for example, for Joe, um, he really wanted to focus on push off and getting his heel that's really gonna help him. But for some other people, it could be uh, the opposite. Um, you know, their, their heel is hitting really well, um, but it's almost hitting too much. You know, they're, they're raising their toes too much. And so we can adjust how the exoskeleton resists and assists with movements to put the ankle in the exact right place it needs to nice. be uh, for, an, for a good step. And so, um, yeah, Joe did really well with this. And uh, I just wanted to show that video. DD made a cameo on the right video. Although <laughs> yeah, she, I saw that. <laughs> she hopped out at the end. Um, so, uh, yeah, but, but Joe did awesome. And, you know, it was a pleasure to have him in the study. He was super motivated. And, oh, wow. Um, but, but that's everything, you know, I, I, kind of something that I think of that, um, you know, I, I try to think of in the lab. And I think that Daring Adventures does really well is that, um, you know, motion is its own medicine. Uh, just being active and moving around uh, is, is its own medicine. And so uh, we try to do that in the lab. I think Daring Adventures does an awesome job of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that Daring Adventures has over us is it's always fun. It's not always fun in the lab. You do have to you do have to work hard, and Joe knows that. Um, but yeah, you know. Uh, anyways, uh, thank you oh, all yeah. for for listening. And uh, this is one of our participants. I loved his T-shirt. He said, "I tried being normal, but I was too awesome." And um, so that was pretty cool to me. But yeah. Thanks everyone for listening. I know that uh, Sarah maybe wanted to ask a few questions. Yeah, uh, so that I was Didi just wondering and, if and anyone Joe. has any questions, um, maybe for Ben or for Joe and Didi. Awesome job. Yeah, this is a good presentation. Yeah, I think it's wonderful that someone even thought to do this for someone to walk better. I think it's when, unbelievably remarkable that you're willing to help him walk better. It's great. I'm looking forward to having like, one in my like house. In <laughs> for, a river, for River Rampage next year, Ben, you
he got to be thinking about going and going with Joe and being his sidekick. <laughs> that would be awesome. I would love Wouldn't that. Wouldn't that be cool? Exactly yes. on the San Juan River. I would love that. Unless it's Emily, and then you're going to get thrown out the boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You try to yeah. make one waterproof to take on the river trips. Oh, oh that yeah. would be awesome. That would be awesome. Yeah, no, I, like I said um, before, the, the exoskeleton and uh, the company are in its really early stages. So mm -hmm. I think at this point, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of what will come of all of this research. Yeah. We do, you know, part of the reason it's slow, uh, unfortunately, research is slow, is that we want to make sure it's actually doing what we're saying it's doing. Um, I, we could release the device right now and sell it. And I'm sure uh, people would buy it, but it, it's just not, it's not perfect yet. Um, it's not at a point where we're 100% confident in, in, in it. So that's why we do all these tests and we're constantly retesting everything so that when it eventually does become available to everyone, you can be confident in it as a product. Um, so it's slow. I feel that as much as everyone else feels it, but um, it means that will have uh, an evidence-based piece of technology, which is which is what you want if you're gonna spend money on it. Is it being tested anywhere else in the country? I have a grandson in Texas that has CP too. That's a great question. Um, but who asked that? I'm sorry, I'm looking at these faces oh, it's Karen. right now. Oh, okay. hi, Karen. Hi, Karen, nice to hi. meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. So. Uh, actually, last week, I couldn't have told you whether or not that was going to happen, but as of this week, uh, our lab just got a grant to expand testing to Illinois and Minnesota. So um, this will now be tested at the children's hospitals in uh, Chicago and um, really? I, for I forget the name in Minnesota, but um, it's called Gillette Children's Hospital in Minnesota. Forget what hospital city. in Illinois? Uh, it is Shirley Ryan Ability Institute. It's with Northwestern uh, wow. University. Uh, um, and uh, so, and, and part of the reason we're doing that is we want to make sure we're not just seeing the results we're seeing because we're the ones testing it, you know? Um, it can, you can be biased. That's a big issue in research. So we're gonna send out these devices to these two children's hospitals and make sure that they're getting the same results that we are. Um, so not, I, I know you said your, was it your nephew? My grandson. They your go, grandson. Yeah, they go to uh, children's down in Dallas. Okay, so not there yet, but hopefully in time it will be. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Karen. Will, will you do another yeah, study you. soon here? Uh, I wish I wish I could say yes. It's it's coronavirus that oh, uh, okay. unfortunately it has been such a, a challenge. Yeah. Um, and you know we don't want to put uh, a lot of people at risk. We have been doing some some random testing, but uh, <sighs> nothing nothing like last summer yet. Gotcha. Uh, but hopefully hopefully soon. Hopefully okay, we'll good. be back to testing soon. And we'll be back to daring adventures. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. we all yeah. want to get back to normal. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for coming on thank and sharing you. this with you, with all of yeah. us. Here. We it's will so be having. It's been so awesome to see all of your guys' faces, and we will be having a couple more this month and next month. Um, they should be every Wednesday. We have. Um, damsel in defense coming on to talk about some self-defense techniques that are inclusive cool. and also um, awesome. uh, different equipment that you can use for self-defense we're also going to be having Todd LeMay come on from uh, the terrain hopper USA to talk about the terrain hopper um, different adaptations that the terrain hopper offers that you can also get um, what type of terrain that it can be used on, and he'll be showing different videos of it used on different terrain, um, how much it is, and uh, where you can also go, and what organizations have terrain hoppers for you to use. Awesome. And, and then also some ASL stuff as well. 
which I'm excited about. Yes, yes. Um, and some more camp camping um, sessions and segments as well. This is Ben's uh, address if anyone wants email address if anyone wants to contact him um, with any more questions and all of these um, will be uploaded to our YouTube. Please subscribe, like and add our Facebook and YouTube pages um, and then also on our website as well. So Ben, Thanks. are you able to share your presentation? Yeah, of course. Uh, yes.